Thank you. Hi, welcome. Thanks so much for coming. I hope everyone enjoyed Yom Hatzmaut. We are back. Um, so for this year, we discussed last time we met that we would talk about interpretations of Hashem's providence in the hands of God, and starting from the Pesukim and Tanakh, and then the way it's interpreted. This is partly because it came up in one of our discussions, and it seemed like a topic that people were interested in. And also, I think it's actually an interesting case study of the way that Pesukim the different people can give different ideas and are interpreted over the ages, um, in some ways literally, in some ways non-literally, or expanded. There's always an active interpretation that goes on, which is along the lines of what we've been discussing about allegorical or at least interpretive kinds of approaches to Tanakh. So in terms of the involvement that Hashem has in the world and his running of the world, his supervision of the world, what are perspectives that you've if you had to say what you think is a perspective in Tanakh, would anything come to your mind? Like how much you think Hashem takes an active hand in this in running this world on a day-to-day basis? You know, it's a big question. Mm. Not like not necessarily the first thing in the <laughs> this year or in the morning. Anything, any like general perspective that you would think is sort of you mean then or now? I mean the perspective of Tanakh. Let's oh, say. Perspective. Yeah. Um. What do you think? Okay, so let's look at a few psukim and see what we think, and then we can see how there are different streams of thought within Tanakh, and also different ways that the psukim are interpreted through the ages also. Okay, so some of the perspectives on Tanakh are really just full of this optimistic, hopeful view of Hashem's involvement in every individual person's life, and, and in a way of, of real faith. And which I think would be instinctively the way that we would like think about religious faith, right? That like Hashem is Hashem really runs people's lives and Hashem, everything comes from Hashem. And that certainly is borne out by many of the Psukim with which we're very familiar from different parts of Davening. Um, the first one actually is is from Tehillim. The Mipi Olim, I love these Psukim, and mm-hmm. um, they're very beautiful. Mipi Olim Bion Kim Yisad Taoz Laman Sarecha Lashpito Yev Mitna Kim is the famous Pasuk that from the mouths of babes and sucklings you have established strength. Um, to make the enemy to sort of make the enemy oh sorry is it stable the right um, put the enemy at bay ki yareh shamecha maaseyetz botecha yareh v'chochavim asher konanta like when I see nature when I see the the shamayim and the everything that you made and the stars that you made ma enosh ki tiskerenu ven adam ki tafgerenu what is man that you would remember him or like sort of pay attention to him. But nonetheless, you do. But right? You put him right beneath Hashem, and you gave him kavod v'hadar. This isn't exactly talking about how much Hashem is involved in the day to day, but it is really saying Hashem remembers and thinks about man. Hashem cares about man. Hashem made everything, and yet he yet he cares about the individual people. And then the next couple of sources, I think, say it even more strongly convey this idea. And these are psukim that are we are we do well know well from our tefillot. The next one from Ashrei. So may Hashem l'chol hanoflim zukev l'chol hakfufim that He supports everybody who falls or is bent over. Ene chol elachi yisaberu v'atan notin lahem et achlam b'ito. To the very individual level, everybody looks to you, and you give each person his bread in his right time. You give every single person what they need. Poteach et yadachu maspia l'chol chay ratzon. You open your hands and you take care of every living thing. At a very individual level, really Hashem's been, you know, beneficial way of looking at the world and interacting, running the world. And the next one from Hallel, also, Hashem is Haman Bihi La Shabbat, he, he lives up high, he dwells up high, um, but he also Hamashbili Li Rotz Bashamayim Ba'aretz. He comes down and looks, he Mekime Me'afra Adal Me'afot Yarim Avyon, the individual poor person, he lifts up from the garbage heaps and makes him sit with the Nedivei Amo, and he lifts up the Akarat Habayit to make her an Aim Habanim Smecha Halaluka, right? He lifts up the barren woman to give her children, and every individual person in their own kind of misfortune, Hashem looks at them and takes care of them, right? So this is certainly a strong theme in Tanakh, and I think a strong aspect of religious life, of what it means to be a religious person, to have that kind of faith that there is the hand of Hashem that, that runs the world, right? Yeah, that's, I guess, the Hashka Pratit view of Correct. Yeah. Exactly. And it's borne out in the very famous Divrei uh, Chazal in the Gemara and Brachot, near next source, that, that when Rabbi Kanina says, that every single thing is in the hands of Hashem, except for Yirat Shemayim. In other words, this comforting sense that Hashem runs everything, even though man can still make his own free choice in terms of morality and chart his own moral course, but Hashem really runs every single thing in the world. Right? So the problem with this approach 
And the way, reason that I think there are other interpretations of it, even within this idea, both in Tanakh and, in, and throughout Devei Chazal and Rishonim, is that it really raises questions about Hashem's justice, right? Meaning if Hashem controls every single thing for every single individual, and Hashem is good, right, which we believe, and Hashem is omnipotent, and Hashem is omniscient, and Hashem controls every single thing, then why do so many people who are good people suffer in this world? So on the one hand, it really instills a sense of faith that every single thing in our lives comes from Hashem. On the other hand, it really raises questions of divine justice. And, you know, within the normal ups and downs of life and struggles, we can maybe say, okay, fine, but it comes from Hashem and I can learn something. But when a person really experiences tragedy or we see something that are things that are really awful in this world that are beyond those normal ups and downs and struggles that we can sort of take and understand that maybe we're meant to learn something, then it really raises some serious questions, okay? And that's why I think it's worth looking at ways in which, while this remains an important stream and certainly an important way to relate to Hashem that we you know, believe in Hashem's providence, there's also a lot of interpretation that goes on with regard to this approach that we're going to look at and I think is a good example of the ways in which there is some kind of not always completely literal reading of Sukkim and Tanakh. Yes? I would say this, this view has a, a big weakness, which is if God controls everything, where is man's free will? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. So it is hard to, right. So, so the, I think the Gemara is trying to address your question when it makes that statement that Hashem controls all of the circumstances of man's life and man makes his own moral choices. You're right. It becomes like that's an approach. It is hard to apply that to every situation, understand what does that mean. Like obviously those things intersect sometimes, the circumstances and your moral choice. They're not always so well-defined. Um, but I think exactly your question is what Chazal are sort of wondering about and trying to make an approach, trying to develop an approach to when they make that statement in Gedim Gemara and Rachel. Okay, so there are, we're going to look at a few sources in Tanakh that sort of affirm Hashem's direct and active involvement in supervision in the world, but with a, a little bit of a, a slant on reward and punishment. Um, and how those are interpreted in Debrei Chazal, given that question of divine justice that we asked about before, and that we don't always see that people get what they deserve. Okay, so the next passage in Yirmiyahu is sort of along the same lines that Hashem controls things, but with more of a retributivist type of slant, that people get what they deserve. Not just this like happy Hashem gives everyone what they need, but also, and he gives everyone what they need when that thing is not good, right? So the next pasuk in Yirmiyahu um, ends with that that your your eyes Hashem are open on the man, all the ways of man that you give each person according to his own ways and according to the fruit of his actions, right? You give everyone what they deserve. And this idea of retribution, that the world is run in a way that operates on divine retribution, is certainly echoed many times in Chazal. That in the next source, the Gemara in Baba Kama, says, that Hashem never, this is in like a positive sense, Hashem never takes away or like removes the the reward for anyone, even just the reward for like speaking nicely. Everyone gets what they deserve, that's like the positive slant. Or in the Mishnah and Sota, which is more of a negative slant, the way that a man acts, that's sort of how he's treated also. Usually that idea of mida keneged mida is, I think, always used in a negative way. I can't, I would be thrilled if uh, someone could think of another example, I'd actually be very interested in that, um, but I can't think of a, of a case in which mita connected mita is used in like, you did something good and you got something good. Usually in Debrei Chazal, it's used in a negative sense, um, <laughs> which is interesting. So the so the so this is sort of a, a, you know, coming off of that idea that Hashem runs everything and everything in the world comes from Hashem. So this is saying everyone gets what they deserve. But as we said, we know that everyone doesn't always get what they deserve. And Chazal certainly knew that. And certainly people in the time of Tanakh, everyone has always known this. It's not a secret, right? So from the very beginning, there was some discomfort, a sense that this is a strong religious belief. And yet it can't just be this, right? This can't be as simple as it seems. We obviously don't see that the world operates in this way, that people always get what they deserve. And so I want to look at a few different say two different ways that this has been interpreted. So again, taking this principle from Tanakh and then interpreting it in a way that's not entirely literal, beginning with Chazal and going through Rishonim. Probably beginning even before Chazal, but the sources we're going to look at begin with Chazal. Yes. When you talk about Midah, connected Midah, yeah. we always tell little children 
when we're young, we learn that if you do something good and you return something that you found, whatever good, it's going to be good for you too. Mm -hmm. And then when we grow up, it swings to the other direction. We find that it's that more of a negative thing. Yeah, yeah. It's right. Sort of like a big uh, contradiction. Yeah. And it's hard for us to adjust to the fact that you can have something bad happen to you and still be a good person. Right. Because your whole life you're inculcated with this idea. If you're good, things will be good. Yeah. Right. So I think it raises a question of whether we really should be saying that kind of assurance to, to children. I think it's a, you know, I think that there's a way to instill a sense in children that Hashem loves them and that the things they do matter without making that kind of promise, right? Because even children will, will see that that's not always the case. And I think, you know, there are times that we don't tell children the whole whole truth, and that's, you know, okay, maybe part of growing up, but I don't think we should ever tell children something that we'll have to later tell them was actually false, right. you know what I mean? So it's a little well, bit of a different, like, sort of opening exactly. things up gradually versus having to actually reverse oneself, yeah, I think is, I think that's challenging, but I think you're right, I think it brings up an important question about how we communicate these values from an early age. Okay, so one approach within Chazal, we saw one approach that was really just, yeah, there's Mita connected Mita in this world, but Chazal also obviously recognized the need to look beyond that. And so there is a strong sense in Chazal that maybe, maybe, one way of understanding this principle is that it's true, Hashem does give people what they deserve, but not only, not always in Olam Hazal, right? That's one approach. We sort of, we keep the principle, the idea of retribution and reward and punishment and divine justice, we keep that as a principle, but we're going to like sort of broaden our view a little bit and say, maybe in this world, people don't always get what they deserve, but they ultimately, we're going to trust that they ultimately get what they deserve. We believe in a God of justice. That is one way that Chazal interpret these psukim, because Chazal clearly recognize, as would any, you know, as does everyone, that, um, that it can't just be that people get what they deserve, it's just not what we see in this world. Okay, so a very well-known Gemara in Kedushin comes next, which really is one of the most classic, but by no means the only, uh, Way, source in which Chazal speak this way. And Rabbi Yaakov, he to Amar, so quotes Rabbi Yaakov, it's Char Mitzvah Baha'i Amaleka. There is no reward for mitzvot in this world. It's not in this world. Tatanya Rabbi Yaakov, Omer, Ein Lecha Kol Mitzvah, Mitzvah Shekatuva Batora, Shematan Zechar Abitzida, Shein Tzchi Yazamezim Tchul Yabah, Bekibud Av Aim, Ksiv, there is this very famous story. Laman Yarichun Yamech Laman Yitav Lach, Beshilu HaKain Ksiv, so he tells a story about how the, uh, the mitzvot, there are very few mitzvot where the reward is written next to it, but it is that way about kibbutz Ab Aim, it says that you will have long life, and it says the same thing about Shilu HaKain, sending away the mother bird, and then he quotes the story about a guy who went up and he did both, the father told him to go do Shilu HaKain, and he did, so he was doing both mitzvot at once, and then he fell down and died, okay? And so the Gemara asks, Heichan tovat yamav shelzev, heichan arichos yamav shelzev, so how does that like, what is that? How did he get to of Yemen, or how did he get a Rikhos Yemen? Limani Tavachat, the Olam Shakulato, Ulamani Arikhun Yamachal, Olam Shakulo Arach. Okay, so it really is referring to Olam Haba. So this is a first approach within accepting this idea of retribution and justice, but saying it can't just be limited to this world. We're not rejecting the idea, but we're interpreting. We're interpreting the Psukim to say that we have to take a broader view and say that maybe that reward and punishment will happen in the next world. Okay? That's one approach. There is another approach for which I think within Chazal, which still takes into consideration this idea and really believes in the idea of divine retribution and justice, but in a different kind of way. It, it limits it or it limits it and defines it in a different way besides this Olam Hazet, Olam Haba thing. Okay, and for, to look at to understand this approach, I think we first have to look at the most famous psukim maybe about divine justice, which we say every day in Shema. Okay, Vahaya im Shamawa. And so the brachot that are promised, so in Shema, where more often if you like, look in the art scroll, it will say you should keep in, in mind the principle of believing in divine retribution, reward and punishment when you say this. I think it says that in the Siddur, because that really is the theme of Vahaya im Shamoa. And what are the basic brachot, what are the rewards that Vahaya im Shamoa promises? Right, rain and, you know, and uh, agricultural kinds of brachot, right? So, so what's the problem with saying that if I do something good, then I'm going to get rain. Doesn't always happen. Doesn't always happen, first of all, right? And then it's the flip. If you don't do something good, there won't be any. Right, and that also doesn't always happen. But also the other problem with it is one that the Ramban points out, which is that it's not just going to rain on my 
backyard and not rain on the net. Like it doesn't work like that. It's not like rain comes. You know, if the if the if the reward is something that seems like it can't possibly be so individualized because this has never worked like that in the history of the world that it rains on this person's farm and not on the farm next door, then so how is that? How is this the collective? Right. It seems like it has to be something a little more collective because if this is the paradigm for reward, then that's so interesting, right? It could have said, like the Torah, if the Torah wanted to, the Torah could have said, you'll have, you know, you'll have good health, you'll have, your family will be, you know, whatever. It could have said things that are more individual. It didn't say that. It's the, the, the thing that the Torah used in the psukim that are most central about reward and punishment are something that can't possibly happen to just an individual. It just doesn't work, right? Mm -hmm. So that's interesting, right? And the Ramban points that out in the next source, which is on Bahaya Im Shaboa. And he says this is actually a paradigm for how divine reward and punishment, the hand of God, works in this world in general. And so he mentions that there's, you know, there are things, there are azharot le'achid v'azharot le'tzibor, right? There are some mitzvot that are more toward, um, you know, an individual or a person, or like a group. And then if we read the underlying parts, ki Hashem lo ye'aseh hanisim tamid. Hashem doesn't always do miracles. He doesn't like always control nature um, as a nace. He only does it when like the mo in response to the actions of the majority of the people. Okay? But the Yahid may have like, his own sort of life that, that follows its own cycle according to his uh, his actions, but like basically he doesn't have this impact on, he doesn't necessarily get these brachot that are being promised. And if we move down a little bit, he says also, Okay, so he says in general, the general principle is Hashem really sends reward and punishment based on the acts of the collective. Now, for, there might be exceptions. He says for tzaddikim gemurim, like unbelievable tzaddikim, or rishaim gemurim, then maybe Hashem will like get involved because he thinks they really deserve their own special reward or punishment. But as a general principle, it's not how Hashem works in this world. When we say there's retribution, there's divine justice, there's reward and punishment, we don't necessarily mean that Hashem runs the all of nature according to the individual. Okay, it's more of a it's more of an idea of on the basis of the collective. And um, similarly, in the Gemara and Baba Kama that we are quoting next, um, it quotes the idea of very interesting proof from Pesach, that well, the well-known Sikkim Pesach. It's so interesting when you like see a Pesach you know so well and then in a like, totally different light. The Atem lo teitu ish mi Pesach beito ad boker. Like during the night of Makas Bechoros that people weren't allowed to leave their homes, right? Why? Because the Malach Mavas, like that's what Chazal say, the Malach Mavas where it's going around killing people. And he points out, What that means is once there was this gzeira, that the Malach is going to go around killing people, then even if you were a total tzaddik, he's not, it's not going to matter, right? It's, it's more, it's, again, it's more collective. Once there's a gzeira, it's a gzeira against the whole people. And it's not going to help you if you, you can't be the, like the one exception. You can't just have the rain coming down on your property. You can't be the one person who walks out on the night of Makat Bechorot and doesn't get killed. So it's this idea, there is this idea within Chazal, and it could have you know, brought more quotes from Rishon, and, and Rishonim actually, we have the Ramban here. And there are you know, a lot of other examples of this as well, but that accepts the idea of retribution, but on a communal level, okay? In, there's a variation on this approach that it's not just necessarily communal versus individual, but just that Hashem, Hashem's uh, divine justice and retribution does exist, but it's just like different in different situations, right? So the Rambam very famously in Mora Nebuchim, um gives the example, gives, like says, describes what he thinks about this by saying, divine providence does not watch in an equal manner over all the individuals of the human species, but providence is graded as their human perfection is graded. So this is similar to what the Rahman said earlier about Sadiqim Gemurim and Rishayim Gemurim. It says, in accordance with this speculation, it follows necessarily that his providence may be exalted, that watches over the prophets is very great and proportionate to their degree in prophecy, and that his providence that watches over excellent and righteous men is proportionate to their excellence and righteousness. So he, as for the ignorant and disobedient, their state is despicable proportionately to their lack of this overflow, and they have been relegated to the rank of the individuals of all the other species of animals. Okay? So he basically says 
that according to a person's righteousness, closeness to Hashem, they may see more direct divine intervention in their lives. But the sort of the, the closer they are, the more they experience that, the farther they are, the less they experience that. So it's a similar type of idea, not exactly communal, this is not communal versus individual, but the idea that Hashem's, yes, Hashem has this divine providence, um, but it doesn't exist in all cases in the same way. What does he mean by ignorance? So I think he, it's hard, to, he, he really, uh, the, the Rambam in general really connects knowledge of Torah with righteousness. So I think that's, he, uh, you know, he has that view, which is sometimes, you know, not, not, certainly not the way all we show them look at it, um, but that is the way that he views it, that knowledge of Torah is connected to righteousness. It's not the only thing that's part of righteousness, but it is a part of it, okay? And the Sefer Ha'ikaram says something that I think is actually even sort of maybe more, uh, more surprising. So he says that sometimes the Ashlishiti Shalifamim Yagyu El Hatsadik Ra'ut Bisibat Harasha, Kamoshi Yagyu Tavot El Harasha Bisibat Hatsadik, Kamosha Amarnu. So it's not always that like every single individual gets what they deserve. Sometimes something might happen to a Tzadik because of something that happened to like something that a Russia did, and vice versa. Vzad mi panim shonim, even pnesha ha avod ha yubashaim and ixara lehem, the alzaram onesh, masha hu yimashik, the hareaha paha zarahahu, shayu rishayim otadikim. Like one way is that a person, let's say there's a family, there's a whole family that where their ancestors did something really bad, and so that led to certain things not being good for that family. So let's say, I, the way that I think about it, what he's saying is, like, let's say there's a family where they, you could even think about it not just in a religious sense, right? They made some poor decisions and ended up, you know, having various problems. Let's say they ended up being, you know, losing their property or something like that. So not only one descendant is going to not have that affect them. I mean, once something affects the family, it affects the family. And so it's hard, so this is an example where someone, there may be like sort of collateral damage. A person may be impacted by another person's decisions. He's born into a situation where he's affected by what other people have done just naturally. Like maybe it happens in the regular world for good and for bad. And he's saying it happens maybe in the religious world also. It's like an interesting idea. Yeah. Is this the same idea as mm -hmm. Yes, idea. exactly. So the question is, why do I have to suffer? Because my grandparents right. made a sin. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So it, it definitely raises theological questions. It sounds like he's saying, this is, what, this is the way we understand providence in this world. That Hashem doesn't always make exceptions. Okay? Okay. That there is general providence, but not always to the degree of making sure that every single individual gets what they deserve. Right? It can be hard to swallow. Right? This is what he's saying. Who likes yeah. this? And then the next example that he gives is So he's, this is a little bit more addressing your question. He says sometimes it's even if the gezera isn't like decreed on the whole family, it was just on the avod, but nonetheless, once it affects, once there's a punishment to the avod, then that has repercussions on the rest of their family, even if it wasn't because Hashem made a gezeira on the rest of their family. Let's see what he means. Kamosh misha haya ashir. So the example that I referred to before. Uvavur chato avad mamono v'nesharu banav ba'oni. Afapi shehim tzadikim ba'avon ha'avod o kamo im ha'avod chatu v'nigzar alehem galut v'galut v'nesharu b'neihem acharehem ba'galut ba'avon avihem. So it's like, let's say different kinds of punishments. A, per, a family becomes stricken with poverty because of a divine punishment, or a family is sent into exile because of a divine punishment is the other one. He, so even if Hashem didn't mean for that to be because they were on the children, but nonetheless they are in exile, right? Because their parents went into exile. So, and you can see this in terms of a family. You can see this in terms of like, you know, Jewish history, right? Once people were exiled from one place, so then they were in exile. Now we don't look at that and say that was a punishment, those people were bad. We don't look at Jewish history that way, but he's saying that um, that this can sometimes, even if we would never look at a historical situation and think that, that it is sometimes the case that people are born into circumstances, not because of anything they did, but that he actually believes that there is divine justice in this world and retribution, but nonetheless, it doesn't always impact everyone exactly the way that, like, reflect their own actions. It could be sort of the mikreh, is what he's saying. Okay, what do you think about this? I don't think anyone likes this. No. <laughs> We're not. Rabbi Yosef Abba walked into the room right now, he'd be in trouble. <laughs> I have a question. So I'm aware that my parents did something wrong and I'm making tshuva. Mm -hmm. So where's my tshuva coming in? Yeah, 
Right. So that I think is is the big question we would have on him. And he might say like we I don't know the answer to that, but this is he may be describing something he thinks he sees in this world. Like this may be his response to saying I maybe there are ways you could do chuva, maybe there are ways around it, but I'm looking around me at the world and I'm not seeing that people always get what they deserve. So what I'm going to say is that maybe there's divine justice in this world, but it doesn't always like translate perfectly into every individual person. Mm. It could be that that's what he's trying to say. The way yeah. I learned it was that the future generations will continue getting Xeva unless they do tshuva. Right, so we certainly say, there are certainly sources that say that about like Amalek, the children of Amalek, and other kinds of situations. Absolutely, there are sources like that. The Abney Nazar is very famous for saying that. It happens to be that it doesn't look like what the Sefer Egyar is saying. He seems to be, maybe he also thinks there's the potential to do tshuva, but he is saying there are situations in which people don't get what they deserve. Maybe because they were born into unfortunate circumstances based on something someone else did. It's not a happy picture. That's not a happy picture. Yeah, and maybe he doesn't think it's a happy picture either. Yeah, uh, doing, doing the right thing. You know, you could say, look, why should I bother? Because this is my favorite. But that, isn't that true for like a lot of what we just read? Right? I Meaning a lot of these people are in some way scaling back the hashgacha pratit a little bit. So you could say for the Rambam, he's still saying you have that ability to maybe move up the ladder and get closer and closer to Hashem and then have more hashgacha pratit. But like also saying that things are more communal is taking away some of this. And the issue is that as much as it sounds unfair, and I don't know that I, I'm not personally endorsing any of these positions, as much as it sounds unfair, but the fact is that we do see unfairness around us. We do see that it's not true that people get what they deserve all the time. So I think part of what these Rishonim are doing is they're looking at the Pesukim. It's not that they don't like the idea that Hashem controls everything and every Hashem takes care of everyone. And that's beautiful. And they believe that to some degree, but they're also looking at it and saying, I have to interpret somehow. I have to come out with some kind of way of like, applying this to a world in which I don't see that. I don't see that everyone gets what they deserve. And I'm trying to come up with maybe some kind of rationale for doing that. So in some cases, it would be... Maybe it's based on the person's own sort of like level of closeness to God. In some cases, maybe, maybe more collective versus individual. In some cases, you could go with the approach of saying, maybe the nicest approach is saying it's not all an olam hazeh. Everyone does get what they deserve, but maybe it's an olam haba. All of those are different approaches, and this is an approach of saying, sometimes an individual sort of, there's collateral damage. And when I look at people who seem to not be getting what they deserve, maybe what I would think, or if I look at myself, like, you know, whatever, then maybe what I would say is, Maybe this is someone who's sort of a victim of some kind of collateral damage. But all of these, I think, are approaches to, that are trying to believe in that principle and say that that principle is true and uphold it in some way, retribution, divine justice, Hashem's hand in the world, but make it work with a world in which we don't see that happen all the time. And coming up, we basically saw four, I think, different approaches to how could you maintain that principle, but modify it or interpret it a little bit to be consistent with a world in which we don't see that principle always happening. It's not very hard for <laughs> Bita Kong, for, for yes. beliefs. And, and in, nowadays, I don't know how many people even look at this. Everybody thinks, oh, for sure. For sure. You know, everyone right. walks around and thinks that God is like a zoom in on them only. Mm -hmm. And this whole premise we learn, but it's not inculcated in us Correct. in any other way. In right. schools or in schools or in... Right, and maybe that's good. <laughs> like, I don't know, I don't know if this is actually so hopeful um, for aspects of belief, but the problem I think is that when you come up against a situation where it doesn't seem yeah. correct right. that people are getting what they deserve. So I think these are all people who are trying to come up with a system where they can like make sense of that. Uh, I don't want to like destroy <laughs> anyone's <laughs> beliefs. The Rambam's approach that Hashem is not Right. Pulling the strings on every little thing. He's, mm -hmm. The world has gone forward and he has certain uh, control, but we really, like, he's not deciding if I'm having cereal for breakfast or. You know, or right, but it's not even more than that. He's not, the Rambam actually seems to think that he doesn't even decide major things in an individual's life necessarily, unless that person is in a very unique category, right, which is different from what we often think right. as religious people. Don't worry, there are other perspectives. <laughs> so not the end of this year. Um, but um, I think it is troubling. I think I think it's valuable to recognize that it's hard. You can't just sort of stay with the psukim, just as we talked about with allegory in general, because it raises its own questions, its own problems, and sort of what you brought up before. Like, what about when we end up seeing that doesn't happen, right? Um, 
So I don't know, did any of the, so far, we're not done yet, but so far did any of these perspectives on trying to maintain that idea in divine justice, but like interpret, expand, modify a little bit, anyone think speak to anyone or is it just disturbing? I'm sorry, I'm not trying to just be disturbing. It's, it's very <laughs> gross. Um, yeah. I, I would just say that, you know, we have a very limited view of what is actually happening. Mm -hmm. mean, nobody says that here, maybe somebody else says that. Mm -hmm. Hashem has a broader view of what is going on in the world. Mm -hmm. So when, when we sing, we, when we see bad things happen, yeah, it affects us and it's terrible, but we don't really know what's behind the scene. Exactly. So I think that's a, maybe a little bit connected to the Olam Haba, Olam Hazad idea that, like, in a sense, we don't have the broad view. Mm -hmm. Whether you define that as Olam Haba, Olam Hazad or something else, but it's sort of saying what that principle that there is justice, but we don't necessarily like see it in our experience. The Rav has a part in Koldo Di Dofik, we're gonna look at Koldo Di Dofik later, but I actually didn't include this part, where he talks about the idea of like the tapestry, right? And I think it's based on a midrash that you could see, you know, maybe God sees like the front of the tapestry, we see the back of the tapestry, right? We see how Tassa doesn't seem to, doesn't look beautiful, it's, we see all these knots and colors running into each other, so there is also a front of the tapestry. Right? So that is, I think, the idea that you're saying, and that is a very beautiful idea of saying, maybe we can just say, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's not true that we have to reconcile these to with our experience. Maybe we can just say, we believe in divine justice, we believe people get what they deserve or need, and we're just not seeing the front of the tapestry. Then that's beautiful. That could be a wonderful approach. I think it's sometimes, again, I think it's one of those things that maybe works better when we're dealing with like the regular vicissitudes of life. I think it's hard to say that, maybe about a true tragedy, right? Then it's like a little bit hard to, maybe harder to apply that type of faith to that and uh, to feel like that's sort of sufficient, right? Okay. Another separate approach within Tanakh. Everything we learned so far was based on that first approach of there's divine justice of the world and then different people trying to interpret that in some ways to apply to our lives. The, ne the next approach is perhaps one that will be more, that's more familiar and we'll be more comfortable with which is just the plain idea of like, I was once in a, in a lecture by Dr. Schatz at, at, um, who teaches at YU, and he said it's just the, basically the approach of park your theodicies at the door. Done, we don't know. Like, just like, stop trying so hard, right? <laughs> and this is the idea in, which begins in the Psukim also, separate stream of thought, which is perhaps what you're saying. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Your ways are not my ways. And yeah, you, know, you, don't, you don't necessarily understand, and you're never going to understand, and we shouldn't try to come up with all these like hash bonos about how things work. And similarly, in Eov, that's basically the take-home message of Eov, right? When Eov is the safer about why do bad things happen to good people, and goes through dozens of prakim about different possible explanations, and the conclusion really is, why are you machshi chetza? Why are you like making the way of wisdom dark? And in the end, Eifo hayita b'yasti aretz, hagid im yadata bina. Right, where were you when I made the world? Right, you don't know, you just don't understand, you don't know the mind of God. And so suffering is essentially inexpl inexplicable. And we don't know, divine justice, divine providence. Who, yeah, we believe that there is, that Hashem controls the world. Um, exactly how that works or why that works or why bad things happen, we don't, we don't really know, okay? So, which could be satisfying or not satisfying to different people, you can imagine, right? So, the, this perspective finds voice in Chazal in many different sort of forms and many different concepts. Um, so first, there is a concept in Chazal of what's called Yisurin Shal Ava. This is maybe one permutation of this. That sometimes there is suffering that doesn't imply that Hashem has rejected a person or is punishing a person, but but it happens either because of or notwithstanding the fact that he loves that person and that person did nothing wrong. Okay, so in the, first, in the source in Brachot that comes next, If a man sees that suffering comes to him, he should look into his actions and try to do tshuva. Because it says, let's investigate our ways and return to Hashem. If he looked in his actions and didn't find anything wrong, then he should say, maybe I was Mabat al Torah. So it's not completely rejecting the idea of retribution, that sometimes suffering comes as a punishment. 
Shinamar, Ashayan Gaber shared to Yisrael Nukami, Torah Chutlam Danu. I think this Pasuk juxtaposes Yisrael with Torah. Vivim Talavalomatsa, and if he really, if he did that, but really it's not even true, he didn't find any ways in which he was, he didn't make good use of his time to learn Torah. Be Yadurin Shi Yisrael Shal Avahim. Shinamar, Kiat Asher Yahav Hashem Yochiach. Okay, so if, so it, again, it's not saying that there's never just punishment, reward and punishment. Sometimes it really is a punishment for something. But sometimes it's not. And when it's not, we say this is in the category of Yisurin Shal Ava. This is in the category of suffering that comes, again, it's not clear whether it means because Hashem loves someone or even though he loves someone, he allows this Yisurin to happen. And there is this category of Yisurin that are just inexplicable. They're just Yisurin Shal Ava. They're not a punishment for anything. Okay, and hard to know exactly what that means. What are you storing? What would be the purpose of you storing? Oh, but, but presumably, it implies that there's a certain compassion potentially that people develop through troubles, through struggle. <coughs> there is a certain perspective on life. You, you know, it's hard to say because the Gemara doesn't really define it. But perhaps it's saying that there is there is some kind of something that people some way in which it's a sign of love for a person to have a level of struggle. Again, I think that's much easier to say when you're just talking about the regular ups and downs of life than, God forbid, a real tragedy. Um, but, um, but perhaps that's what the Gemara is implying, that there is, certainly that there are Yisurin that are not because of punishment, and that they're, they're, they're called Yisurin Shal'ava, whether it means that Hashem is giving them because he loves them or he's giving you even though he loves the person. Uh, okay? That sort of reminds me of something I heard recently. I think it was in connection with the the Holocaust, but I, I'm not sure. This person's view was that um, we, uh, suffering is a part of life. It's just woven into the fabric, you know, the mm -hmm. way water is wet or the sun is warm. We shouldn't even speculate about why, mm -hmm. but learn what to do when it occurs. Right. Yeah, you know, that has its, I guess that it has its defect also, but that it, it's some, it seems to me it relates to this, um, Correct. Yes, that idea of, of yeah, absolutely of like inexplicable yeah. suffering, and certainly when we see the rough, he's taking. I think that approach is very much connected yeah, to what he says. There are other sources in a chazal that don't speak about yisurin and shalava. That the phrase is a little bit difficult, right? That idea of suffering of love. It's like a hard. It's a hard phrase. There are other sources in chazal that do sort of uphold this idea of inexplicable human suffering, but certainly not based on punishment, but in different terms. Rabbi Yana Yomer. In the famous mission in Avos, in biyadenu lo mishavad v'shaim ba'ach lo mitzuri hazadikim. We have no ability to explain the tranquility of the wicked or the suffering of the righteous. Remember, I knew a family when I was a teenager that had gone through, unfortunately, an enormous amount of suffering and loss in their life, and they actually had. They noticed they never really talked about, about you know this particular Mishnah, but they had it in an illuminated frame on their wall, and I just like I always like thought about that. How every time I see this mission, I think about how that must have been some kind of source of strength to them, that idea that, yeah. um, that we just can't explain it, right? It's just there, and we recognize that, and we can't explain it. And similarly, the Gemara in Menachos that comes next tells about the torture of Rabbi Akiva for teaching Torah, and it says, Zo Torah v'zo schara, and Hashem mm. responds, this very harsh phrase, mm -hmm. kachala b'machshava l'fanai. You're never going to be able to understand, this is what I decided to do. This was my instinct to do. So all of these in different ways, some sort of thing we just don't know, something it's Yisur and Shalava, something it actually is a decree of Hashem, but we just don't know why. They're all different, these three different sources, but they are all sort of saying we're not attributing it to punishment. Yes, yeah, so go ahead. We've been talking mostly about the righteous who suffer, but suppose you did it from the other point of view. Right, you would, exactly. Would, would it change the picture anyway, or would it still be the same? It's interesting. Right. I mean, so the Mishnah and Abbas sort of puts them both together, which maybe implies that... Um, one is the opposite. One is right, the there's sort of two of sides point. of the coin. Yeah, maybe. Okay. So, responses to this approach so far? I mean, it may be a... Uh, it's, yeah. I think it's an improvement, though. <laughs> it's better than the other one. <laughs> it has its lacks, but it's an improvement. Right. Yes. Right, so I think what's interesting about it is it makes a lot of sense to us, right? It's certainly a lot easier to accept that we just don't know, and Hashem has a, you know, we just don't know. It sometimes can be a little bit hard if a person, or a lot hard, if a person is going through suffering and doesn't necessarily feel that there's, like, any rhyme or, not, not that anyone wants to feel the punishment, right? God forbid. But that the, I don't know, I think sometimes it's also comforting to know that Hashem runs the world and Hashem makes everything happen for the right reason, and this doesn't necessarily tell us that. 
right? This tells us we just don't know. Maybe there's a, maybe, who knows? Like how much is Hashem really determining this or not determining this or is it for, you know? So I can see how different people might take comfort from different, sometimes it's sort of good to know Hashem has his reason and it makes sense somehow maybe in Olam Haba, you know? It could, people have, could have different reactions to these two approaches. I could imagine, I, I sort of intuitively feel that this may be more comforting like philosophically, but there might be something that feels a little bit more like caring about the other approach for a person who's some, going through something very difficult. And not, again, not the punishment idea, but the idea that like Hashem is controlling things and ultimately Hashem will, will make things work out and you know, Hashem has a plan, you know, which isn't, which may be part of this approach, but not necessarily. Yeah, any mm. thoughts? Yeah. Are totally off base? <laughs> I guess it's hard to know, right? What I don't, what I don't like is, um, when there's a terrible thing that happens and some Hasid Shul mm -hmm. Rabbi says it's because we're thinking we're yeah. Shikhar or something. Right, that, that for sure. <laughs> yeah, very different. I mean, certainly even within the first approach, nowhere does it say that any individual knows what the Cheshbon is, right? Yeah. <laughs> even if that approach is correct, it never says, like, you can look at it and figure it out. You know, you know, mm -hmm. this goes to this. Okay, so let's see a couple of contemporary ideas that relate to this approach. So one well-known and incredibly powerful um, voicing of this approach is from the Eish Kodesh, which was, um, as you've probably heard, written during the time of the Holocaust in the Warsaw Ghetto by Rav Klonimus Kalma Shapira, who died during the Holocaust. And it's a, it's a compilation of his drashot during that time. So he says, well, see, let's maybe think about which, which of these sources in Chazal he's sort of echoing the most. So he says, at one level of the verse, he will call on me and I will answer him. I am with him in his distress. Means that when Jews are in pain, God forbid, there is a point at which God bears the distress together with him. Another level, however, is that when the pain of the Jews is so great that they have no strength to bear it, then the strength to resist, to continue to endure, to remain alive in the midst of such terrible hardships and merciful, merciless affliction is provided solely by the blessed, Holy One, blessed be he. In this case, the brunt of the burden is, as it were, upon God. It is not human Jewish strength that bears and withstands such agony, but God's strength that he gives to Jews. So long as pain is with us, though, we must accept it upon ourselves with love. Though we may have been convinced that the passage of a month would bring change and then a month passed with no sign of abatement, we must not let that make us angry, God forbid. We need to know that the Holy Blessed One knows more than we do. He is the Jewish Father. He is the heart of all the Jewish people, and the heart knows what is happening to the body and suffers with the whole body. Suffering is God's commandment, and when it comes, this is an unbelievable paragraph, when it comes to God's commandments, there are statutes and there are judgments, right? right? Kukim and mishpatim. There is a pain that comes as a judgment, as a mishpat. We can understand its purpose because we can appreciate the benefit that can be derived of it. But there is also suffering that is a statute, a hook, whose purpose is incomprehensible to us. To the contrary, it may appear purposeless, as described above. While every statute requires the exercise of faith, statutes that are incomprehensible require irrational faith. Only when we bind ourselves with absolute faith to God in a way that is irrational can seemingly purposeless suffering be sweetened. Another, okay, sorry, that, that I, um, that's a note that I wrote to myself. Right. Um, so that is, the, that is the approach of the, um, of the Eish Kodesh, right? So which of these sources in Chazal do you think that sort of reminds you of the most? Uh, that we can't know. But it's it's softened. It's softened. By saying bit. God suffers with us mm -hmm. at some point. But it's basically we, we don't know why. We don't know. This idea of even associating with Chukim is like very interesting. Um, it sort of sounds to me a little bit, and, and I don't know if this is true or not, just the way it sounds to me, that maybe he's a little bit like darshaning the idea of Yisur and Shalava, right? The idea of suffering of love. Because what he's really saying here is that this is a he uses that idea of God's love throughout this. He says Chukim also. But that idea that we have to believe that Hashem is suffering with us, the heart knows what's happening to the body, we accept it upon ourselves with love, right? That maybe he's sort of saying that is what Yisur and Shalava are, is when it's incomprehensible, and yet in some way it's, it's also a sign of our closeness with Hashem, that we know Hashem is suffering with us, that there is like a love relationship that exists. I'm not sure, I have no idea if he had that Gemara in mind or not. But it, it strikes me that like maybe this is a sort of a drush on the idea of Yisur and Shalava. Well, we know if, if it said Hashem went down to Mitzrayim, mm -hmm. with Ben Israel and suffered there, mm -hmm. and then Moa Nochi with Sarah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so maybe that is what Yisur and Shalava are, that idea of Moa yes. Nochi with Sarah. But it, but it also is, raises a very tough question. Hashem is omnipotent. Hashem mm -hmm. is all 
or powerful, so he's, he's suffering along with us. Mm -hmm. Maybe he should have just not made us right, Why would he do that? <laughs> yeah, and it really leaves that question open. And I think the, the rub speaks a little bit more about that. But you're right, I think that's a, that's a challenge of this approach, is it still, it basically leaves it as a question, is that better than having some kind of answer now? I don't know, I assume people would feel differently about that. Yeah, but there's, there's like a, you know, age-old question of evil. Yeah. Does evil come from Hashem? Does, where does evil come from? Right. And, and, you know, it seems like in this case Hashem can't overcome that evil. I mean, we don't know. Mm -hmm. We just don't know. We just don't know. And so part of what I think is interesting is how much that question is bound up with Hashem's providence in general. Like, sort of, in a, they're, in, like, inseparable. Because that's really where the questions about Hashem's providence come up is in the question of evil. Um, okay, so another more modern uh, source that, that deals with this is Koldo Di Dofik, very famously the Rav in Koldo Di Dofik, where he, um, he rejects, and I think maybe he's addressing that question of why does suffering happen, he rejects the idea of even asking why suffering happens, because he says that there are, that if you can answer why suffering, why evil things happen in the world, then you've made it not evil, right? If I can say this thing happened, but this bad thing happened because of anything, any reason, then it's not evil. It makes sense. It's good. It has a good purpose. But it's right? still evil. Well, it depends on how you define evil, right? Um, so let's say, um, you know, Korban, the book of Netza. So he, he was evil, but there was, maybe Hashem had a reason for it, a, 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 a purpose, but it's still evil. Or, or, well, or Hitler, or Maximal, or something. Right. It's so, still evil. So I think what he might be concerned about with that is that, again, it depends on how you define evil. If I could say that the Hurban, for example, happened as a just punishment for something, and it was like part of Hashem's plan even, then maybe Nebuchadnezzar wasn't a nice person, but I just almost made him an instrument of the hand of God. And then in that sense, I took away his evil. Right? I made, I justified what he did. Oh, he could have chosen someone else. That he did the evil that I don't the evil that I do. Okay. So I think there are different perspectives on it. What you're saying is often, is, is definitely an approach in Rishonim and is often applied to Paro, right? The idea that, that Gullah Spencerim was decreed and yet we still blame Paro, and that's a big question why that happens, and different approaches. So you're right, you could absolutely say that. The Rub is suggesting maybe, though, that in any case we sort of reduce the evil or sort of reframe it once we say that what the thin person did was actually like in some way an instrument of like God's hand, then we're, a little, we're in some way we're trying to rationalize the evil. That's what he's concerned about. You could, you know, debate that. I think you could see that both ways, but that's his perspective. And he responds to that by saying, the man of destiny is highly realistic and does not flinch from confronting evil face to face. His approach is an ethical halachic one, devoid of the slightest speculative metaphysical coloration. When the man of destiny suffers, he says to himself, evil, evil exists, and I will neither deny it nor camouflage it with vain intellectual gymnastics. I am concerned about evil from a halachic standpoint, like a man who wishes to know the deed which he shall do. I ask one simple question. What must the sufferer do so that he may live through his suffering? In this dimension, the center of gravity shifts from the causal and teleological aspects of evil to its practical aspect. The fundamental question, the fundamental question is, what obligation does suffering impose upon man? We do not inquire about the hidden ways of the Almighty, but rather about the path wherein man shall walk when suffering strikes. We ask neither about the cause of evil nor about its purpose, but rather about how it might be amended and elevated. How shall a person act in a time of trouble? What ought a man to do so that he not perish in his affliction? The halachic answer to this question is very simple. Afflictions come to elevate a person, to purify and sanctify his spirit, to cleanse and purge it of the dross of superficiality and vulgarity, to refine his soul and to broaden his horizons. In a word, the function of suffering is to mend that which is flawed in an individual's personality. The halacha teaches us that the sufferer commits a grave sin if he allows his troubles to go to waste and remain without meaning and purpose. Mm -hmm. So what I think is important to point out about the Rav here is he is not saying, I don't think, that when something bad happens to someone, that, that he needs to say, Hashem made this bad thing happen to me so that I you know, would for any particular reason. He's saying you actually shouldn't be even asking that question. We just don't know the answer to that question. Why did this happen? I have no idea. But given that it happened, what do I do next? 
how can I make the make something out of this situation that's meaningful and become a better person? What he's saying is that suffering as a category exists in this world to elevate people. But I don't think but he's sort of saying we shouldn't ask about a particular bad thing why it happens. The evil, like bad things, it's inexplicable, right? We don't know why this bad thing happened. But what we do know is Hashem created this experience of suffering in the world. And because that experience can, can if a person like, is able to rise to that challenge, can uplift a person. Okay? Which is like, it's a fine distinction, but I think it's an important distinction. Right? Because it's not, it sort of removes that ability to even question the hand of God, um, but it still gives meaning. And it means also, one thing that I found comforting about this is that even if I look at the Rishonim, and I say the fact is a lot of Rishonim say that man, Hashem doesn't control the details of my life. That's, that's the reality. And so that can feel very like hard if something hard is happening because you almost want to feel like Hashem made this happen, that there was some purpose to it. But if you look at the rub, he sort of relieves that burden because the rub allows you to say whether or not Hashem made this, detail, this particular thing happen to me. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. I have no way of knowing. But whether or not he did, it almost doesn't matter because I know Hashem created this experience in the world for a particular purpose. Do you know, so it still helps you sort of feel the hand of Hashem or find meaning in something, leaving aside the question of whether Hashem made that thing happen. You know what I mean? It's been, I've, I've personally found that like very helpful as an approach in terms of like being able to find meaning even without being able to know for sure that, you know, that this definitely happened because Hashem made it happen. Based on what he said, what he wrote, what we're doing here is ethico-halachic or speculative metaphysical? Correcto. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> well, which one is it? <laughs> um, no, so I think he would say it's the, it's the bad one, whatever it's called. Uh, right? <laughs> the, speculative metaphysical. The speculative like, metaphysical, right? right? <laughs> this whole thing, this whole venture. Okay, so I want to wrap this up a little bit. My, my goal today was to sort of see how there are different perspectives in Tanakh, but even how those perspectives are really modified, interpreted, limited, in some way, by interpretation, because they have to be, because people are taking the psukim and tanakh, and again, we don't always read psukim literally. We need to also make sure that they really reflect our understanding of God. Um, but I think there's also a limit to all of this, which is part of what the Rav is referring to. And I'll tell you, I remember I had a, I have a close friend who, a number of years ago, maybe you know five or ten years after she graduated college, went through like a very very hard time in her life and was, was grappling with several things. And she found that unfortunately, one thing that really made it harder for her was that she'd learned Jewish philosophy. She said, before I learned Jewish philosophy, I would have just said, I believe in Hashem. Everything comes from Hashem. Hashem makes everything happen for a reason. This is really, really, really hard, but, I'm, but my faith is gonna give me strength. She said, because I learned Jewish philosophy, so now I don't know. <laughs> now I know that like, Maybe there are Rishonim who would say this didn't happen to me for a reason. And I don't know which Rishonim is right, and I need to know that right now. Because it doesn't help me to say, well, maybe I could find a Rishonim who would make me, you know. She said it really was a source of stress for her. And so, to her credit, she wrote to Dr. David Schatz, who was her professor of philosophy at Stern, and who taught her all of these things that were bothering. He said, she wrote, the Kavod Rav, your class ruined my life. <laughs> she, said, she said, I don't know how to find comfort in my faith anymore because there's just too much. Like, I know too many perspectives and I don't know what's true anymore. And when I need it, I don't have it anymore. And so he wrote her a very incredible response, actually. He shared with her an article that he had written. It's an incredible article. I'm happy to send it to anyone if you want. I have part of it here, which was called, he himself wrote it, and it's, and it's an amazing book it's called God and the Philosophers. And it's a, it's a book that was published of um, essays by different religious people, both Christians and Jews, I believe they were all Christians and Jews, who are philosophy professors and are religious people. And it was about their encounter, of, like that experience of philosophy and religion, the ways in which they come in conflict, like being a philosophy professor and being a person of faith are not the same thing. And they wrote about different aspects of their conflict. He wrote an incredible essay in that called The Overexamined Life is Not Worth Living. Uh -huh. And I have to say, I think it's it like really might be my favorite essay in the entire world. It's like really incredible. Because it sort of takes all of this and more. It says like, okay, you know, that's not all there is to life, right? Um, so, 
So I'm going to read part of it with you. But if anyone wants the whole essay, I'm happy to share with you. It's really amazing. So he says, what counts more, vividness, excitement, and intellectual engagement, or analytic proof? My own vote is for the former. My commitment is not rooted in the naive notion that reason vindicates my beliefs. It is rooted rather in what Judaism provides me with, intellectual excitement, feeling, caring for others, inspiration, and a total perspective that is evocative and affecting. Intellectual excitement is one source of my love for my religion. Another is the inspired lives of my religion's devotees. Recently, I attended a talk given by an Orthodox woman who had been bound to a wheelchair from childhood. I believe he's speaking about how the will agree be here. She is married to a blind man, and remarkably, they are raising a family. She spoke about the Jewish concept that this, too, is for the good. She explained how life had done her good turns by means of ostensible coincidence, which in truth she felt were signs of God's intervention. By means of her theology, she had turned adversity into inner strength and advantage. The thought of contesting her invisible hand's interpretation with philosophical arguments seemed so offensive as to be unthinkable. Anyone who would impugn her perspective would only be reflecting their own lack of spirit. Anyone, um, I'm sorry, if that evening someone had furnished me on the spot with a dazzling philosophical solution to the problem of evil, of evil that would have done less for me as a person than this simple autobiographical expression, which from a philosophical standpoint seems so simplistic. Philosophy, this is an amazing paragraph, it says, philosophy has its place among the truly enjoyable, challenging, and edifying endeavors in our culture, but it is not the arbiter of all we think and do. What we do in our study and what we do in the rest of our lives are often not commensurate, because the study is the smaller room in life. Without question, the essay that has stayed with me the longest is William James's The Will to Believe. James's argument was that our passional nature not only lawfully may, but must, decide an option between propositions, whenever it is a genuine option that cannot by its nature be decided on intellectual grounds. Notoriously, James has been accused of giving license to wishful thinking about and fanaticism, and I've taken pains to admit both that I don't want to license just any view, and that I do not have a principled way of licensing some things and outlawing others. But in choosing between living with this uncertainty about how to draw lines and discarding passional attractions altogether, the former seems the more human and appealing course, right? So I think this is like an incredibly important perspective on all of this, right? That we, we turn to the Torah for, for our beliefs, we turn to the Sukkim, we try to make sense of them, we do our best, we interpret. But life is not all about that, right? There is also, there, I, don't, I don't know who can, you know, why it's such, an, such a principle in our culture that like reason trumps everything else. It just doesn't, right? We can learn all these different approaches. Some of them might appeal to us, some of them might not. Some of them might appeal to us today, and not a different day. And, then it's a, and that matters, right? That is being aware of the psychological, the emotional impact, the sense of connection that an approach builds, or just being able to say, like, none of these approaches work. That is just as important as any other, or maybe more important than any other way of considering these questions. And I feel like sort of getting that license from a philosophy professor to look at life that way, to me, is just like I really turn back to that a lot. I just think it's a very important perspective um, to take on all of these questions. And it reminds me of the, uh, the next, the next the final source that we have, which I think is maybe a, an idea similar to Rabbi Schatz, by Rabbi Schatz, but that said, was not said much earlier in the Gemara. Um, that, uh, it's, so it says, Kivitanya, Shimon Ha'amsoni, Ba'amri Lana Chemia Ha'amsoni, Hayadorish called it in Shabbat Torah. So, it's in Shabbat Torah. So, right, so he came and they, they, this, he darshaned out, he explains, every time it says et in the Torah. Kevan Shigia el et Hashem alokacha tira, pirish, Amrulo Talmida, Rebbe called it et in Shabbat Torah darashta, matahe alehan. So, when he got to et Hashem alokacha tira, he stopped. He stopped interpreting, because that's it almost sounded like there was no way to do that that's not heretical, to add something to Hashem. Because it almost sounds like you have to say something else, you should also tira like, like Hashem. And his, his student said to him, what about all the other etin that you were do, do Were they all wrong also? Because now you just found out your whole thing doesn't make sense, because you can't interpret this basic. So maybe what happened to all the rest of the etin that you did do reish? Amr lehem keshem she kibalti schar al adrisha, kach kibalti schar al aprisha. Right? Just like I got scar for interpreting, now I'm getting scar for holding back. Right? The overanalyzed life is not worth living. Right? There's an there's a analysis in this interpretation. It has its place. You get, there's scar for it. It's a good thing. 
right? There's also a scar for Prisha and not needing to like understand every single thing in this world, right? And then and the paper concludes that Rabbi Akiva says, you know, did dorish that act and he said, refers to Talmudic Bahamun. Um, but I think that idea of scar al hadrisha, scar al aprisha is pretty much what, what Rabbi Schatz was saying, what Dr. Schatz was saying. Um, and I think it's an important perspective as we think about these like very large questions in faith. Okay. Heavy stuff. Right. Heavy stuff. Heavy stuff. I was thinking maybe next time. The truth is that we sort of came to the end of what I was planning to teach in this in this series about allegory and interpretation. But what we could do, if this is interesting to you, but tell me honestly, um, is I was thinking like we could learn a little bit about Miguelat Ruth along these lines of like response yeah. to suffering. Yeah. Is that something that you've learned before? The idea of Ruth's response to suffering in her Megillah? This is good. That's good. You gotcha? That's good? Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Yeah? Good? All right, so next time we'll, that will be our concluding cheer. We'll talk about through these, but in through the lens of Megillah Ruth. Yeah. Okay?